Well, good evening, everyone. As you're starting to join us, welcome. My name is Dan Clausen. I'm the Director of Ministry Expansion with Truth78. Uh, as we take a few minutes for people to get oriented and welcome to the webinar, um, if you could, if you could look for the chat feature, it would be a joy to know uh, who you are, uh, where you are from, and uh, also what church you're a part of, and what kind of primary role you play in the discipleship of the next generation. So for example, uh, my name is Dan. You'll see that here when I chat. I'm in the Tampa, Florida area, and uh, the church that I, by God's grace, serve uh, the Lord in. My family and I is called The Grove, and I am a father and a pastor. So Mark W., totally fine, listening, not inter interacting, thankful for you. Brother Ben Platter, hello back from Loveland as well, Mill City Church, pursuing some gospel progress there, Buffalo, New York, Children's Ministry Director, Pamela, your reward is literally in heaven. We are grateful for our Children's Ministry Director. Sunrise Community Church, friend up the road there, Jacksonville, um, Miss Cindy, Mr. Jeffrey, so thankful for you all. So once again, those of you that are just now joining us, we're going to get started in just a few moments here and uh, see Columbus, Ohio. Beth McCown, my sister in Christ. Beth, we love you, your gospel work. We are very thankful to, to serve you. Rebecca, our sister in Louisville, uh, a joy to do ministry side by side with you as well. So very thankful for each one of you joining us. And uh, even the grace gift, you are very responsive people. Thank you for letting us know where you serve the Lord, the church you're a part of, and then the roles you play. Uh, just a dad, Mark, we love you, bro. We love our dads. May the Lord bless your discipleship efforts. So we will now formally begin. Uh, so welcome once more on behalf of the Truth78 team to the Discipleship Begins at Home webinar. So you'll see now a few of the um, topics that we look forward to um, just talking through uh, with David Michael and uh, two other friends that he will introduce, Stephen Candace Waters. And let's just answer some big questions at the beginning, even about the need for discipleship, some encouragements, and then some question and answer time as well. So definitely finish introducing yourselves to us on chat. And then through the entirety of this webinar, we view questions as a gift. So please uh, put your questions into the chat. I will be collecting those during this middle portion of the webinar. And then we have some special time set aside towards the end to cover those questions during the Q&A. So once again, thank you for being here. Dan Clausen, Director of Ministry Expansion with Truth 78. And now I have the joy to introduce you to a brother in Christ and a friend, also the founder and executive director of Truth 78, David Michael, a godly man who has a shepherd's heart. And if you shake David Michael, you're going to get a zeal for disciple making for sure. So, uh, Mr. David Michael. I pray your internet is working well, <laughs> sir, and uh, thank you for being with us and leading us this evening. All right, well, what does man do and what does the Lord do? do? The man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. So let me just uh, remind people of Truth 78, our name and why we exist by God's grace. And uh, Dave will be back with us in a moment. And if we have further difficulty, we'll go to Steve and Candace here in a moment. But join me now in the reading of God's word with Psalm 78, 1 through 8. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old. Things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, 
that the next generation might know them. The children yet unborn and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. And it's our prayer that we would not be those stubborn fathers. And you go all the way to the end of Psalm 78, and we read about David, that with upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. May that be true of us, our churches, our homes, that we would, with upright hearts, shepherd our children for the glory of our King and do so with skillful hands. And may even now, it would be such a joy if the Lord in his grace would allow just through a simple webinar, through simple people, yet indwelled with the spirit and convicted by the scriptures and Bibles in our hands that we would actually increase in our skill. So I would like to have uh, Steve and Candace Waters join us. They are dear friends of the ministry. And uh, I've had the joy of being in their home before. And uh, we should have queued up the video. Uh, it was a classic just worship jam session with your family. I forget what instrument I was playing, maybe bongos or I think something. I it was the egg fun. shaker or something <laughs> like that. Something that took no skill. But um, we're thankful to the Lord for your lives and ministry. And I know that you're going to have uh, several things to share with us when it comes to not only what you all, by God's grace, have sought to be faithful with in your home, but this is your life's work in your church, community here at True 78. So I'm very thankful for both of you and look forward to learning from you as well this evening. Well, thank you, Dan. We are hopeful that David will be able to get reconnected here. He has something just really valuable to share in terms of the need, the significance of the responsibility that we have for discipling the next generation, as well as some of the concerns that we see just in the patterns of how generations that were meant to tell one generation who would tell the next generation have not been been faithful and how we've seen a generation that is walking away. And what we're we're seeing is that there is a, a natural orientation toward the prevailing culture around us. Uh, we really appreciated uh, Dr. Al Mohler in a message that he shared at a national conference for Truth 78 previously, where he talked about how in the promise, as the Israelites were to go into the promised land, how Moses was speaking to them, knowing that they were going into Canaan and mm -hmm. that if they were not faithful, if they were not intentional, then the default would be they would become Canaanites and that we recognize that is the case with our families now. Um, I did notice it looks like David is able to join us. So we are going to pause. We are looking forward to coming back and talking about uh, ways that we can be intentional in family discipleship. But I think it would be valuable for David to set that stage. And so, David, you want to jump back in there? I think we should keep talking. All right. <laughs> David, you are welcome to jump in anytime if, um, if you're able. Oh, yeah, to I'm sorry, Steve. I was going to suggest, uh, I think I got a way to make this work if I follow you. So you just keep going and do it. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your patience and grace. You know, we were realizing, uh, Candace and I, a, a, we really benefited from mentors in our lives, older couples who were very intentional about encouraging us and the responsibilities that we had as Christian parents mm -hmm. for the faith of our, our children. And we realize we are those older couples now, that we are one of those mm -hmm. older couples now. Uh, our youngest is turning 15 next week, and we recognize we've been at this now for about 23 years. And by God's grace, we have seen the fruit mm -hmm. of God's word at work. 
in the lives of our children. And by God's grace, they are trusting and hoping in him. And so we wanted to provide some encouragement for you. Uh, we want to lead out tonight with five encouragements for intentional family discipleship. We are going to uh, take questions from you. We know we've just got an opportunity to hit some of these encouragements at a high level, but we want to encourage you to post some questions in the chat. And Dan's going to be pulling some of the questions from that after we finish. And we may change the schedule around a little bit, but at some point we're going to be coming in and taking those questions along with David. And so just have those in mind uh, since we probably won't be able to get to everything in the 15 minutes or so that, that we have here. But we want to answer that question, how can we be intentional in discipleship, especially when we think about those responsibilities that we see in God's Word, I think especially of what we see in Deuteronomy 6, in Psalm 78, in Ephesians 6, in Matthew 28, where in those passages we have these imperatives, these callings as Christian parents to teach our children diligently, to declare the glorious deeds of the Lord, to not hide the testimony, but to teach the next generation so that they'll set their hope in God, and to raise our children in the fear and instruction of the Lord, and to make disciples and to teach them all that Jesus commanded. And so it's important for us to ask if that's our responsibility, if that's our calling, how do we do that? How can we be intentional so that our children aren't left to just drift toward the default and to follow and hope in the culture around them instead of hoping in the Lord. So our first encouragement tonight is to have God's word on your own heart. When Moses talked to the Israelites, but right before they went into that promised land, the land of Canaan, he directed the people saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your children. In order for us and for you to be able to teach our children God's word, we have to know it. We have to love it. We have to read it. We have to trust in it. And they need to see us making God's word the foundation of our own lives before we can teach them how to do that. And we do see there a specific calling to dads that there is specific wording, fathers instruct your children. And even in that passage in Deuteronomy, this um, context of when your sons come to you as fathers and ask, why are we doing this to have an answer for them? And I appreciated how Dr. Al Mohler at um, that, that message he gave was sharing how by God's grace, Anytime we are to teach someone else, we learn more. And so it, it is a grace that we have a responsibility to teach the next generation because that means we have to study in a way that we can teach. And obviously, um, we can't give what we don't have. And so that's why it's so significant. We begin our day going to the Word, depending on the Word, looking to the Word for our life, and then to overflow from that to our children and what we teach to them. With God's word on our hearts, the more we have hidden in our hearts, the more diligently then we can teach them. Notice how Moses describes it. He says, you shall teach them diligently, God's word, to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. God designed discipleship to be parent to child in an along the way, every bit of life pattern. And so our next encouragement is to develop regular patterns of discipleship. Parents, we have the obligation, responsibility, but joy of discipling our children as we walk along the way, around the breakfast table, in the minivan, as we drive to school, or as we, as we go to soccer practice, or as we're driving to church, as we're in the grocery store, there are opportunities for conversation at every point along the way in your day. 
However, I'm guessing you, like me, know that there are a lot of distractions in our culture. And there is the temptation to always be looking at a screen, not only for us, which is a huge temptation, but even for children. I see the youngest of kids on phones, and I see moms at the park pushing their baby carriages, face glued to the screen, not giving their kids any attention, not being in the moment with their kids. So this is a great opportunity for us to be countercultural Christian parents who are fully present with our children and being careful not to let screens and other technology overtake our opportunities to disciple along the way. And so that probably is more in that category of the informal, the opportunities that God gives us along the way. But there is value in protecting time to have patterns Mm -hmm. of discipleship, of studying the Bible, of uh, memorizing scripture, of prayer, of blessing your children in, in prayer. And we appreciate the insights that Don Whitney's professor at Southern Seminary, um, here where we are in Louisville, he wrote in a, a book called Family Worship, where he talks about what many of us think of when we think of family discipleship, which is that idea of family devotions. And maybe um, I, I think most of us have some kind of context for that based on what our parents did or didn't do when it comes to family devotions. But I, I appreciated his um, context here. He says, parents should teach the things of God to their children at every opportunity. However, the best time for parents to teach the things of God to their children on a consistent basis is during some kind of family, during a time of family worship. And he says consistent father-led family worship is one of the best ways to bring up children in the Lord's discipline and instruction. And so there is so much value in having a protecting a rhythm, a pattern of going to the Lord as a family. And it's, it's something that um, we admit can be challenging. It was difficult for us at first. And I think part of the reason is because we made it overly complicated. We really um, recognized we had to simplify in order for it to become a more sustainable routine pattern for us. At the time, there was a, a book that was recommended to us about having these family nights. And I remember trying to invest in that and have a real meaningful, engaging family devotion. But as I started preparing for that first night, there were just all kinds of props and activities and scripting. And and it was frankly exhausting trying to pull it off. And then I remember trying to do another one and just realizing this is this is difficult. So I ended up talking to the person who recommended the resource. And he said, you know, in our family, we found we, we really just had to simplify. And his, his kids were a little further down the road than ours. He said, you know, they were just sharing with us recently how the most valuable time for them was the time that we would just open the Bible and just read through um, a passage and, and pray and, and know that the word is powerful and that it can, it can shape. Now, he said, as we had more time, we began to ask questions. You know, we'd read a passage and we'd say, what does this tell us about God? What does this tell us about ourselves? Um, how does this show us our need for the gospel? What do we do with this? And so we, we, we began to do that. And we just found we could just work through so much mm-hmm. more scripture. And we're just encouraged. We just picked up, began in John and started working through and found that we were able to just grow more and more um, patience and engagement with it. Even the simplest devotions, though, um, take effort and energy. And so just reading through the Bible with our kids after dinner, we said, we're going to start reading the Bible together. And of course, the first night somebody spilled their milk and there was some squabbling over on the other side of the table and the two-year-old was tired. And it took a few days, maybe a week, But we kept at it, and within five or six days, Steve noticed our two-year-old, Teddy, going over to get his Bible off of Daddy's chair and bring it to the table. Because for him, he observed, oh, this is our new pattern. This is our new routine. And so helping your kids by just having a regularity is really a gift to them. And be encouraged to push through the hard till you get to the point where it's a habit. Yeah, just recognize there's... um... I mean, it's almost a scientific law, right? The, uh, something in motion will stay in motion. You've got inertia working against you 
trying to get patterns and routines started. But if you're persistent, you can begin to see that those patterns, routines begin to work for you mm -hmm. with this orientation of this is this is when we go to the Lord. This is when we go to his word. And I, I just want to add that as we began to expand, as our kids had more ability to engage, we really came to appreciate good devotional resources that do organize um, study in, in the Bible and even provide some good discussion questions and opportunities for prayer. I mean, just for an example, one of the ones that we really enjoyed going through as a family um, this past year was Your Promise Gives Me Life. Just working through 40 of God's promises and having the passages to focus on, the questions to be able to observe, and even some direction and how we can pray about that was just so helpful. And there are so many great resources like that. More Than a Story is one of the, the best resources for that now. There's an Old and New Testament volume with both of those um, providing that kind of structure where you really spend time around the Word and have good questions, good engagement, direction with it. Yeah, as they get older, there's more they can do. As soon as our kids started being able to read the Bible, it was really great to have them help with the reading. So Steve would divide up the psalm that we were in and say, oh, there's 12 verses, there's six of us, everybody read two verses. Having your children participate in reading the word and then as they're able to, asking them to pray as part of the family prayers has really been a sweet time and, and you're modeling for them what to do, but then they're practicing with you and you can guide them. Um, I think you mentioned your own experience in, in family discipleship. I remember my dad had this funny Bible reading voice and it got very serious and very formal. And I appreciate how Steve keeps his normal voice when he reads the Bible to our kids. You don't want it to be weird and so formal that it's awkward for them. You want it to be flowing out of your heart, a heart full of joy, joy in the Lord, and letting your children enter into that. Amen. And we also found as valuable as that family discipleship was, especially, I mean, just the efficiency of having the whole family together to work through um, being in the word and praying together, just how significant it is to still have one-on-one -on -one discipleship. Our, we have four different children at different ages, different stages. and Three girls and a boy. Uh, three boys and a girl. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Forgotten already. And we just came to appreciate that we interact differently with our children when we are with them individually. And so I think um, our oldest at the time were eight and 10 when we just started getting into a pattern where we would alternate every other Friday and take them out for a breakfast and just start an engaging time individually with them. Um, often working through a book, I remember early on starting with something like The Young Peacemakers, and we really wanted to be able to help them do conflict resolution in our family from a biblical model. But more, more importantly, um, it was just that one-on-one -on -one time where we were able to have dedicated engagement and... Uninterrupted. Yeah, and focused on things that maybe wouldn't be as easy to talk about. Um, if their siblings were there, That's right. really yeah. be able to focus in on particular areas of, um, of difficulty or questions that That's they right. have. But really just carving out a time where they know this is going to be a time where we're talking about the most important things in life. Mm -hmm. And we are going to God's word and to him, trusting him with our needs. And so just to get that pattern in place. So just this morning, um, we started a, a new pattern with our um, next two oldest. And so we're meeting every other Thursday. So just this morning, my 17-year-old uh, and I were together. We've been working through Knowing God by J.I. Packer. Um, we, uh, along the way, you know, worked through things like J.C. Ryle's Thoughts for Young Men. And one of the most valuable times we spent with between him and then also our almost 15-year-old was the Established mm -hmm. in the Faith um, book, just working through kind of discerning profession of faith and even preparing for baptism. One of the things I've most appreciated about Steve's approach to this discipleship as dad is protecting that time. And no matter what's on his calendar, 
as busy as he is, always saying, I'm taking the boy, one of the boys out for coffee tomorrow. I'm taking Zoe out for coffee tomorrow. That, that investment has paid out huge relational benefits. Our children have become our brothers and sister in Christ. They've become our best friends. And that started when they were eight and 10. And the conversations that we were able to have one-on-one -on, -one on Friday mornings continued. It got us through the, the what could be a tumultuous teenage time the relationship just kept going. And so there was a continuity that came through that investment of time and the consistency. So we just want to encourage you to have family discipleship, but also to have some one-on-one -on -one discipleship. All right, two quicker points that we want to make. Just one is the encouragement to partner with your church, to realize that the discipleship of the next generation is a partnership between the church and the family. We, if you think about it, we have so much more time and available than a church does, mm -hmm. but that time that we are invested in the church is such a, a valuable partnership. And so your role as parents, bringing your children into the body of Christ and to have them under the teaching and preaching of the word is such a valuable part of their discipleship. And so we just want to encourage you to help them make the most mm -hmm. of being under that teaching and preaching. So for instance, under the teaching, so bring your children into their time of Sunday school opportunity they have for some more age focused discipleship to prepare them for that time going into Sunday school. And if your church has a curriculum like Truth 78 that has parent pages, make the most of those mm -hmm. parent pages to use those to follow through on what the lesson is going through on working um, with them on uh, scripture memory opportunity mm -hmm. that goes with that lesson, just to make the most of that Sunday school time. It's such a benefit to have other like-minded adults in your children's life, teaching them the way you teach them, modeling reading the Bible, memorizing scripture together, teaching from the word, helping them learn how to ask questions of the verses and answer questions with the verses. All of that is building a, a network of support for your children, a culture that is holding up God's word and, and wanting to make disciples of your children that is so helpful against the, the culture of the world that's pressing in. So the more people like that, the relationships you can have in your church body, brothers and sisters helping to disciple your children is such a, a blessing. And then we just wanna encourage you to help your children to engage with the worship service. And I know different churches may have different models, but we just encourage you to as soon as possible to have your children in the worship mm -hmm. service, help them engage with the service and to uh, not only have a mindset of helping them just manage to get through it, but to learn to, to listen and to engage. And resources like the My Church Notebook that Truth 78 has is, is just valuable for ways that it can prompt them um, to listen for things like every time the pastor says the word God to, to make a check. Just early on, there are ways that they can begin having an orientation of listening mm -hmm. versus an orientation of going to the coloring books or going to a digital device at the very time when the pastor is about to bring God's word yeah. to them. And it's something uh, that you can practice with your kids at home. Talk about the importance of learning how to sit quietly and listen and to be thoughtful about their neighbors around them. Church isn't the time to be handing out snacks and lots of diversions and toys, but it, and, and it's not also just the time to shush and shame kids into being quiet. It's a time to model for them, loving God's word, loving to hear it preached, joyfully singing and welcoming into that, welcoming them into that with you. All right. We know all of this we can be intentional about, and yet it is the Lord's work to cause our children to have hearts that are toward him. And so we know our responsibility that we have and God's sovereignty mm -hmm. over our souls. It all comes together in our opportunity to pray. And That's therefore, our fifth encouragement, our fifth encouragement <laughs> is to be anchored in prayer. We are dependent um, on God for everything. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. And so we pray and we we just want to encourage you to pray for and with 
your children. And so praying for your children to pray God's word. I, we love the big, bold biblical prayers for the next generation and the praying for the next generation books that Truth78 has that just really encourage praying from the scripture, praying um, God's promises, praying for our children and for their salvation and their growth in, in godliness. And then we um, just encourage you to pray Pray with, with your, your children. children. And, and we pray for our children independently of each other in our own personal quiet time. But then we pray uh, together for our children. And especially on Wednesday mornings, we've set aside a time over the years to pray for our children about what's going on in their lives. But also oh, fasting praying, and praying. Fasting and praying, yeah. But also praying with our kids. Of, that happens in our regular devotional time. But I'm thinking here about the the meltdown in the kitchen and it's mommy who's melting down to say, guys, I'm having a really hard day. Would you pray with me? Would you pray for me? They can do that as they get older, but when they're little, you know, the kids are sensitive to what's happening in your home, in your marriage. If you're having a hard day, if something went wrong at work or daddy got a flat tire on the way home, that's a great time to say, kids, we need to pray right now and ask the Lord to help daddy to intervene in our need. He's the one we go to when we are struggling and when we are suffering. Teach your children how to pray by praying with them. Yeah, and just one last point on that. We really benefited from the devotional Lord teach us to pray as a opportunity to not only have a valuable family devotional time in in the Word, but also throughout that, teaching us as a family how we can pray and yeah. to trust and depend on the Lord. All right. That was a whirlwind to try to get these encouragements in there. Um, I will look to our team managing here to see if we're going to go to David, or if we're going to go to questions. But we, I know we'll get to our questions at some point. How about we go to David? And thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. And I am so grateful to God for technology that allows 148 people to gather like this at this moment and others to be able to sign on later and to hear our heart for the discipleship of the next generation. I'm so glad you got to hear Steve and Candace. Um, they are among the most intentional and effective and fruitful disciple-making parents that I know uh, both of them serve with us here at True 78. Steve as our director of marketing and product development and um, Candace is helping us um, with the editing of our Fighterverse blog. She is passionate that the word of God gets in the heart of the next generation. That whole Fighterverse uh, program is a great and effective discipleship tool. Um, what I wanted to say at the beginning, but now I think it does make sense, even here at the end of the content portion, is that um, this the title of this seminar, Discipleship Begins at Home, was actually inspired by an article that our staff was reading from August 31st by Lyman Stone that he entitled Secularization Begins at Home. And he was responding to a new book that just came out a few months ago by Jim Davis and Michael Graham, two evangelical pastors, entitled The Great Dechurching, which documents the accelerating numbers of Americans who are leaving the church today. Parentheses, uh, True 78 was founded 25 years ago now. It's absolutely amazing. But we were responding to the desire that we had for our children growing up in our own churches to, or in our own church, to be established in the truth, to trust Christ, and to be well equipped and able to stand against the forces of darkness that will undoubtedly face them after they leave our home. So the idea was just they would, as they leave home, we want them to be strong and to be able to stand. Um, against or to be able to stand on the truth no matter what comes. And the statistics over the years, we probably most of us have heard them. Uh, we 
seen 60%, which is probably fairly conservative, 75%. Some statistics go as high as 90% of the children growing up in Christian homes do not continue in the faith after they leave home. And that has always been a concern that has helped shape our passion, our zeal for the discipleship of the next generation. Um, what was what Lyman Stone noted based on some pretty well documented studies was that the battleground is not out there beyond the comforts and the security of the Christian home. He says, quote, childhood, including before age 13, is the key battleground for religious formation, not adulthood. By the time children go to college, much of the religious question has been settled. And that that wasn't so surprising. You get that sense that it's happening. As you look at the young people um, in many of our churches, you can see where th that, that could be true. What really struck me, though, was when um, Lyman Stone says Christian parents would noted that Christian parents are often unaware of the attitudes and the convictions that are forming in their children's minds and hearts. He says, quote, as kids get older, they secularize in a way that parents are not observing. Most non-religious children are born into religious households and have already rejected the faith while under the supervision of their parents who believe that they are successfully transmitting these values. In other words, we have children growing up in Christian homes and in churches who by all outward appearances have embraced the truth, accepted Christ, and are even publicly affirming their faith through baptism and other ways. And yet in their hearts, they have rejected the truth now, even though this is new information, as we process this as a team at True78, we've realized that our response to this new data, perhaps, um, it's the same as it's always been for 25 years. And that response, I, so Steve and Candace had five encouragements. I wanted to start with, or I, I now have five responses to this this reality that we're seeing at work. Number one, always be mindful that the souls of our children are our highest priority and primary concern. There is nothing that Christian parents should want more for their children than eternal life and everlasting joy in the presence of Jesus Christ. I talked to many, many Christian parents, and I don't think I found one who would disagree that their greatest desire is for the salvation of their children. Um, Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? We must keep that eternal reality in front of us in a world and in a time where there's so many things that, that compete for our attention, it's, it's important that we recognize there is one main goal of our parent, parenting, and that is the ultimate joy that we want for our children in Christ. And just to note, this is a life to, lifelong concern. When you, Even when you have a high degree of confidence that your child is trusting Christ and walking in the truth, if they are in Christ, they will persevere to the end. But until the end, we should continue encouraging, discipling, um, praying for our children that they will finish well. So this is a lifetime concern that we should have for our children, no matter uh, how much confidence we have that they're in Christ. Secondly, acknowledge that whether or not our children embrace the truth or reject it, whether or not they trust Christ, that is ultimately out of our control. We have no power to raise our children from spiritual death. We can teach them the truth. We can't make them 
love the truth. That's good news and it's bad news. The bad news is we cannot control the outcome of our children's lives and out of the outcome of their faith. The good news is God can. Um, the God who has known his children before the foundation of the world, the God whose unstoppable purposes um, to make his children holy and blameless cannot be thwarted. Um, the other point I would want to make here is under this second point, acknowledge that we're not able to change the heart. I Part of what we need to come to terms with is that God has the right to bring our children to faith his way and on his timetable. We shouldn't conclude from these studies that if our children are secularized uh, before they even leave the home or even after they leave home, if they leave the church and forsake the faith, um, we should not conclude that they are from that information that they're lost forever. Spurgeon, I think it was, who said, as long as there is breath in our children's lungs, there is hope for them. Um, so as long as Jesus is on his throne, um, the gates of hell cannot prevail against the souls of those children that he is determined to bring to faith. So, yes, it's hard to admit we cannot control uh, the outcome of our children's faith, but it is glorious to have confidence that God can. Number three, faithfully and intentionally disciple your children to the truth. This is the best response that I have to Lyman Stone's conclusion. Not the discipleship guarantees, again, the outcome, but certainly the faithful discipleship will be our best response to this threat against our children, certainly a better response than the neglect of discipleship. So faithfully disciple our children. And we really wanted Steve, and they did a great, Steve and Candace did a great job just helping us to understand um, very practically what discipleship can look like in the home. And just keep in mind, this is the usual way that God brings his children to faith. He places them in homes of believing parents who will faithfully disciple their children in the faith. Number four, know your children. Um, just as a good shepherd knows his sheep, so a good disciple-making parent knows his disciples, or a good, any disciple-maker needs to know his disciples. And this, I think, is um, is one of the challenges facing many parents, Christian parents, that I observe in the church. Life is so busy that we're not taking the time to tune in to what our children are thinking. It's It was striking that Lyman Stone pointed out that this secularization is happening right under a parent's nose without them aware. And I think it's just because we've not taken the time to interact with our children. One of the best ways that we can find out what's going on in the brains of our children is to ask questions. Thank you, Candace, for, for sharing just the importance of asking questions. Um, all of True 78, almost all of the material that we publish at True 78 is designed to be interactive, including the, um, the curriculum resources that we have throughout it is lace these kinds of questions. And the good news for parents is, especially in our discipleship resources for parents, is that the answers are in there too. So you can ask the question and know how to help your child respond. And Asking good questions is one of the best ways we can know our children. And then lastly, uh, take heart in the assurance that the faith of our children matters more to God than it does to us. 
all the resources of heaven are available for us, especially the Holy Spirit's power at work in us. All of these resources of God are at work in or available to us and at our disposal. Two checks, two texts, sorry. Let me encourage you with these two. Philippians 2.12, um, work out your own. And I want to just add and work out your children's salvation with fear and trembling. So keep eternity in front of us. We should tremble at the thought. Two possible responses that our children will hear at the end of the age. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in the joy of your master or away from me. I never knew you. I tremble at the thought of any of my children or my grandchildren ever hearing that phrase. So with fear and trembling, work out your salvation and your children's salvation. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work his good disciple-making purposes in and through you. So that's number one. Number two, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, which I think if I were to choose a theme verse for ministry and parenting and everything else, just about, it would be this, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest on me. So if you're listening to this webinar and you're feeling weak, you're feeling inadequate, that qualifies you for the grace of God, which will enable you to do exceeding and abundantly beyond anything that you ever imagined. So with that, I'll send it back to you, Dan, and thank you for these moments to share. Yes, sir. The Lord is gracious in uh, allowing our technology to work. So we're going to be bringing everyone back now, actually, for a time to answer some questions that we've received in the chat. So uh, Steve was thinking you could maybe be an encouragement to a friend on Tamuno. He shared that he's been uh, failing in family devotion with his children Ask for us to pray on, pray with him. He'd be back on track. I was just wondering, uh, one, the scripture that David just offered should be a great encouragement. So, Tamuno, I hope you've captured that. And uh, But would you be able to also maybe equip him with a, a few ideas of what maybe he can faithfully take up today in response to what it sounds like is a conviction for him to get back on track and discipling his children? Yeah, I just want to encourage you that you obviously feel the the responsibility, the the burden, and probably as David was was talking about, you feel unqualified. You feel the the weight of um, the fact that you don't, you haven't had a good pattern, and so that does um, I think make it so important to start by going to the Lord for his grace and praying and saying, Lord, I feel unequal, unable. And so I need you to work through your word and work through me. And then I think just beginning in that simple area after you pray and to say, God, help me to show my children from your word what would would give them life and he may prompt you to um, bring to them what you're studying in the word and to have that come as an overflow from your time in the word or to just say hey after after dinner we just want to take a couple of extra minutes before we clear our dishes and we're just gonna start reading through um through the book of John and just looking to see what what the Lord tells us in a few verses there and then and then pray over it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I would say if you are feeling um, just that discomfort about good questions to ask, there really is value in resources like a, your promise gives me life where we can just go to those words, those those promises 
that that God gives us and have that help of good questions that have already been recommended and then good direction for how you can pray and really help me just give a direction and orientation that that I could just follow. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. And now, David, uh, this is a topic that um, I appreciate you leading the charge in and encouraging a significant group within our church. But so it has to do with grandparents with grandchildren. So what suggestions do you have for grandparents? Well, uh, as Steve mentioned, that's a great question. And uh, probably my most consistent activity um, in with regard to my grandchildren's faith is prayer, as Steve and Candace emphasized. They're, they're 17 hours away from me by car. My interaction with them normally is pretty limited, but I have direct access to the throne room of heaven. And uh, I think, Steve, you, you mentioned, or anyways, we have this little book that I put together called Big Biblical, Big Bold Biblical Prayers for the Next Generation. And um, I think sometimes we can, um, we, when we say pray for our children or pray for our grandchildren, we can pray pretty wimpy prayers that we're not sure God is going to answer or not. Like classic is um, we pray that my grandchildren have a good day. Well, there's no guarantees in the Bible anywhere that God will help my children to grandchildren have a good day. What, What I pray for my grandchildren are things like, oh, God, would you grant that Anna's affection for the world would decrease and her affection for you would increase? Would you cause her today to walk in your way? Would you lead her not into temptation, deliver her from evil? So take good biblical texts. I I have all the confidence in the world when I pray, Lord, would you grant my granddaughter to walk in your way today? I know that's God's will, that she walk in his way. And apart from his grace, she can't. So praying big, bold, biblical prayers. And then if your grandchildren are closer, then look for ways that you can interact with them spiritually. I've known grandparents who um, who go have share the devotions with their grandchildren. So they, um, they're meaning they're on the same devotional routine. They're reading the same text and they get together once a day or once a week and talk about it, or they're memorizing Bible verses together, or just look for ways that you can interact with your grandchildren. Um, and actually there's a, a great ministry called uh, through legacy.com they have these grand Mon- monday nights um that we've spoken on a couple times but it's all about grandparenting and how to make your grandparenting effective and tune in on monday nights and uh, if i could track down the website maybe we can um that would be a great resource for you and thank you, Kate, for that question. And now, Candice, Kate had a second question. Would love to hear your feedback on just knowing the ages and stages of, stage of life for your children. But does discipleship continue with adult children? Yes, it does. And the really cool thing is that if they are in Christ, it becomes two two way. So not only am I asking questions of our 23 and 21 year olds about what is the Lord teaching you? How can I pray for you? What are you struggling with? Where are you seeing God display his power in your life? They ask me questions. Mom, how can I pray for you? What's going on with you? And so the discipleship time has the potential to get a lot deeper. But for those who have adult children who aren't believers, the opportunity to disciple never ends as long as they and you are still alive. And so keep reaching out to your adult children And looking for opportunities to get together and have the kinds of gospel conversations you would have with a dear friend. 
Thank you. And uh, we can put in the chat, I believe is legacycoalition.com is what uh, David was speaking of, legacycoalition.com. So Steve, a very specific question here from Karina, kind of calling you back to the story you're sharing about children reading a book you were discussing uh, in that individual study time. Did you have them read the book ahead of time? Did you just read it together and discuss? Was one yeah. more fruitful than the other? Can you kind of just unpack that? a bit more for us. Yeah, early on, we were doing a lot of the reading just together at the breakfast or whatever the setting was. But as they got to be around 10, 11, um, we did start having them read a chapter before we got together. And if you think about it, it's almost like in school, there's a lot that we learn just from reading books and just having a structure that encourages us to work through a book. And so we don't get the opportunity to discuss everything that's included in a chapter, but it has really been a great way just to orient and guide our children now through some really uh, helpful books that they're getting just as much from their personal study time in it And then our time together really just gets to focus more on application and thinking through those implications from that chapter. All right. And then real quick, Candice, there was a great question about um, how do we, what kind of specific counsel would you give? I could see you at at your church and your community counseling and just uh, discipling maybe a single mom of a, a son and daughter. What kind of counsel would you give that single mom in this topic of discipleship of their children, of her children. Yeah, that is a a great question, Dan. I would start by reminding the mom that God is her heavenly father and that she needs to first and foremost look to him to be the father of her children and to be introducing her children and pointing her children to the heavenly father. For every everyone who has an earthly dad in their life is, has a, a sinful fallen dad, right? And so we all need our perfect heavenly father. Um, and so she she especially needs to lean into God's fatherness for her children. And even more so, the point Steve made, our fourth encouragement to partner with your church, she right. needs the support of the elders and small group leader and uh, brother. Yeah. Christ to come alongside and be for, especially her, well, both son and daughter need a dad for different things, right? But but during um, the teen years, especially to have godly men that she trusts who can come alongside and help fill those gaps. Yeah. And David, our last time, it's running quickly, but for, there's several, a little bit of dialogue going back and forth in the chat about children in the worship service. Mm-hmm. We'd love to hear your wisdom on that. Well, if you'd love to hear my wisdom, I wrote a little book called <laughs> Children in the Worship Service. Yes, sir. I really commend that to you. And in fact, if you disagree with that idea, I really would ask, just hear our case for that. I've told yeah. parents over the years, if you have to choose between sending your children to Sunday school, where they're going to hear great True 78 curriculum and benefit from that, if they have to choose between that and bringing your children into the worship service, hands down, I would say, bring them into the worship service. Mm -hmm. And we give practical reasons why that's the case. I think one of the reasons we have children leaving the church when they go home, when they go out into the world, is because many times children Mm -hmm. on into the teen years are still being kept out of the worship service. Mm -hmm. And why would we be surprised if they quit going to church if we haven't been including them in church from the beginning. So I can get pretty passionate about that, but I really commend the book to you and just the case that we make for children in the worship service and why it's so critical for discipleship. Yeah. And I think you're also answering a question we probably don't have enough time for, but basically about young people now, quote unquote, deconstructing their faith. And I think some would say that uh, there was probably not saving faith obviously. And let's go upstream. Let's be proactive at an early age. And when we talk about comprehensive discipleship and uh, still considering what you spoke about as well, then that God is the one who saves. So whether it's a young person wrestling through, we uh, meet them there with the gospel and dependent in prayer. 
So we did, there was quite a few questions about what about a resource for this and what about a resource for that? So wanted to share two very specific ways we not only want to inspire you towards the discipleship of the next generation, but we want to resource you as well. So you should be seeing on the right hand side of your screen, the ability to click a link and that will open up another tab on your computer. You can come back to that maybe another time, but uh, that tab will open up from our webinar today, some specific family discipleship resources that we've created on one page for you to look at. And if I just scroll here quickly, uh, you can join my family this December 1st with this Advent resource, The Mystery Hidden for Ages. If you're like my family, what a time, Tamanu. I think this would be a great resource for you as well. If any family to say, is there something I can just start or what to do? Advent, the birth of the king. So take a look at that. And Steve also mentioned uh, several of these other resources. You'll see uh, what David was mentioning as well, children and the worship service. And then you'll see the more than the story. This truly is our most comprehensive, intentional discipleship tool for the family to impart the entire whole counsel of God's word. So click that right side of the screen, save that for later. And then we wanted to offer you as well a specific discount on the family discipleship digital library. So some of our friends, maybe you're in a place where shipping is difficult. Our international brothers and sisters, this would be a great resource for you as well. Homepage, True 78 Plus for Families. You can read a little bit more about it here. What's included, you see that price. And once again, we have a special offer, 25% off. And uh, as an example, in my account. So when you go and you're logged in, you click on Family Library, and you're going to see many of the resources we spoke about here tonight. So for instance, once again, Children in the Worship Service. This is basically an e-reader, so you're able to use any type of, of your devices to uh, read these resources. Some of these family devotions, the Your Promise Gives Me Life. Once again, what are we going to arm our children with? Let's give them promises God makes. Take these to the bank. You can guarantee these, these promises. So each chapter, you can do one a day for 30 days. What's one? God always keeps his promises. So a lot of resources. Another one, you could have young children, older children. We have uh, Glorious God, Glorious Gospel. We love and are proud of the gospel. You could print out your coloring page for your younger children. All of our resources from our curriculum. We don't want to just have children know things. We want to instruct the mind, engage the heart, and influence the will. So once again, this entire um, digital library, one-year subscription, 25% off. So wanted to offer that to you all and grateful to be partnered in this important ministry together. So thank you for your grace with our technology difficulties. I know, David, you're going to return now and close our time in prayer before I give a final goodbye and ways to connect with us. And before I pray, just let me say to you all, um, what Dan just said grows out of a heart that True 78 has to help and support and to serve you in your discipleship efforts. Every, just I think I can say every resource that we have is designed to provide for the church and the home uh, a resource to help them in discipleship. So with that, let's pray to the our ultimate hope here together. Lord, I thank you for all who've joined this gathering with a desire for the children within our reach and under our influence to grow in the discipline and in the instruction of the Lord. And we appeal to you now to give us all that we need to build the word of God, the character of Christ, and the joy of the Lord into their lives. We ask that according to your grace, you would help us to be faithful to the calling that you have placed on our lives so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in us and in our children. Lord, give us the faith, the strength, the wisdom, 
the patience, the understanding, the courage, and all the other graces we need for a job that is impossible apart from you. Lord, we earnestly pray that our children will be among those who love Christ and who keep his commands. Subdue every impulse for evil. Bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and conform them to the image of your Son. We don't ask that they be spared pain or sorrow, but that they would run with endurance the race that is set before them. Let them grow in grace and in the likeness of our Savior so that you can look upon them as sons and daughters in Christ and see with delight the work of your own hands. And so work in our lives so that these children that we love and care about will one day see in us the evidence of hearts inflamed with a passion for God. May they witness an intense desire in us for the increase of your kingdom and for the preservation of your truth and for the display of that truth to the world in all of its sanctifying power. May we be examples of the kind of people that we long for them to become with clear insight into your word, living in close fellowship with you, growing in the likeness of your character and in zeal for your glory. And together with our children, may we all be a people who one day, by your grace, look into your smiling face and enjoy you forever. Oh, Lord, hear the prayer of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David, and thank you to our brothers and sisters that joined us. So we will follow this up with an email to you with a link to watch this again. Resources that we mentioned, you'll have those links as well. You can click on the right-hand side of your screen. That takes you to our Contact Us form. Call us, send us an email. It is a joy to serve you, the body of Christ, for the glory of our King. We pray for your faithful planting and watering in the discipleship of the next generation. To God be the glory. Thank you again and have a good night.